I want to give a very special type of message. It's a testimonial type of uh, sermon preaching. It's not the usual mode of operation for me. I like to preach more of the expository type of preaching. But today, if you would allow me the liberty, I would love to share a little bit about my life, my past, and uh, weave that into the message today. I've been a born-again Christian for some 40 years now. That's four decades. That's a very long time. And the past 11 years, I've uh, served as a professor here at Acts, teaching spiritual theology and mission theology. And by the way, for those of you who are not familiar, this is my final semester before my official retirement. But don't be too saddened by that. I'll stick around, and I'm thinking about establishing an institute within our school structure, if the professors and the president and, the, and all those who are making the decisions would allow for that, an institute for art and spirituality, so that we can do an ongoing research and training and also continue to have theodrama production and so forth. So I hope you don't mind if I take the liberty today to talk about myself a little bit. I don't want to take too much time, but I feel like my story and my experience in the past leads up to the message that I want to proclaim to you. When you're in your 60s, yes, I'm in my 60s, I'm in my mid-60s, uh, you tend to reflect a lot of things in the past, and your mind is filled with all kinds of memories. And as I recall those 40 years of my life as a Christian, a born-again Christian, as a minister of the gospel, I have many, many wonderful and joyous memories, but at the same time, I have those memories of sad and tragic uh, happenings. In Christian life, we have those high moments of special encounters with God and great accomplishments uh, in ministry and in the kingdom of God and so forth, but there are also low moments, the dark night of the soul, and our brother Absalom is going through a situation like that right now. We have just prayed for him. We are, our hearts are aching for him. But that's part of Christian life. Suffering is part of the package for us as Christians. I have to say, I've had a, a tremendous privilege of experiencing many different roles and functions in the body of Christ. I'm primarily known as a pastor or a teacher or a seminary professor, but in my earlier days, I was an evangelist. I was a revival preacher. I was a charismatic minister. Can you believe that? I'm kind of coming out of the closet now, letting you know I was involved in signs and wonders, healings and miracles, casting out demons, exercising spiritual gifts, and so forth. I was doing a lot of crazy type of ministry in those days. But my primary passion, and I believe this is my primary calling, is as a mentor, a discipler, and trainer, especially in the area of Christian spirituality. I've had those uh, special experiences of church planting and founding and directing uh, a spiritual training center and serving as a sort of like a mission scholar, not actually going out there, but supporting and equipping uh, missionaries in, in so many ways. I've had other experiences as well as an author, as a dance artist. Can you believe it? I have a background in, in classical ballet, of all things. As a choreographer, as an artistic director, and uh, we've implemented some of that, the giftings and callings, uh, in our theo drama production. We, we've done five productions in the history of our school. So in the process, I gained so much. I gained a lot of theological knowledge. I gained knowledge and wisdom in general in so many different fields. I've had those special encounters with God in a very, very personal way. I've had many, many uh, types of church ministry experiences, and I've had diverse uh, mission-related experiences as well. But in all my 40 years as a born-again Christian, I had a singular reference point to which I always return to. And I think it's important for us to have some kind of reference point, kind of like a navigation system where once you mark it, uh, you can always come back to that, like coming back home. And uh, I have that particular experience to which I refer my entire 
Christian life too. And uh, the word that is relevant to this is found in the, the book of Revelation. Jesus' words to the seven churches in Asia Minor and particularly to the church in Ephesus. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And this is a word that I come back to all the time, that first love, that fresh love that I experienced in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that I experienced initially. You have to understand, Jesus is rebuking this church, but in a very loving way, because he had already commended the church for its theological integrity and moral uprightness. And the church was found to be faithful in his service and persevering through all kinds of sufferings. This is an exemplary church that Jesus is reserving one word of rebuke for. And he says, you've done all that. You're a great church. But there's one thing that's lacking. You kind of lost your first love, your passion, your zeal, the fire with which you started and launched out in your ministries. You see, the churches and institutions with time can fall into all kinds of traditional bondages. We can become institutionalized, and we can become so set that we don't know how to be mobile and flexible and agile before the presence of the Lord. And somehow this church in Ephesus, throughout the decades of its existence, had lost its heart, soul, essence, and zeal. So Jesus says the remedy for that is remember. Remember the past. Go back to that reference point of how you were founded and repent. Turn away and go back and do the things that you have done in those days. It's kind of like the Israelites being constantly reminded of their ancestors' exodus experience. You need to go through that. Remind yourself what your ancestors have gone through, how they were delivered from the bondage of Egypt and how they wandered out in the wilderness and how God trained them, formed them as a nation and the people of God. Remember that. Remembrance is a very, very important thing. And I'm trying to kind of rekindle my memories of how I started. And I guess this comes with age. When you get older, you tend to recall the past tend to dream about the past, and it seems as though the past is calling you constantly. So let me tell you a little bit about how I began my spiritual journey in Christ, and that was 40 years ago, and to be exact, it was in the month of March 1982. I became a radically born-again Christian. I was an artist. I had finished my college education already, and I got a degree in mechanical engineering, but I wanted to pursue my artistic career, so I went to New York City and spent a number of years in New York City, and I uh, was trained in a school called School of American Ballet, and uh, I was going to be a ballet dancer and, uh, and a choreographer. And just because before I turned professional, the Lord comes into my life. I think all that was a preparation for theodrama that we get engaged in in our school. But all that processing, I remember very vividly, for a period of about a week or two, I locked myself in a room. You know, the artists have kind of ups and downs with their emotions, right? And I had just performed this great ballet called Giselle, and I played the leading role in that. And after that high moment of performance, I... I dipped very deeply into depression. I don't know why I think it was an attack of the enemy, but I think God was setting up for my a rebirth and my new allegiance to Jesus Christ. But anyway, I, um, I found myself in my room, and I locked myself in my room, I think for about uh, two or three weeks, as I recall. I was really afraid to leave the place and go out because... I got so emotional, almost suicidal. 
And when you get suicidal, you're afraid of yourself. You're afraid of what you might do when you lose a sense of consciousness or when you go wacky and you go crazy. I thought I might walk up a bridge and, and you know, jump off the bridge and so forth. So I couldn't, I couldn't trust myself. So I locked myself in my room and I got some books from philosophy and, and the area of religion and I grew up in a Christian family, but I wasn't really sure that Jesus was the only way. So I got all these materials. I said, I have to know the truth. I have to know if there's God, and if there is God, which God is the true God. And in the process, to make the long story short, I really felt that, that Jesus personally died for me on the cross, shedding his precious blood for me. I realized that I was a sinner. I was damned, and I had no other way but to turn to Jesus Christ. And this faith that my parents had been talking about, the church that I've attended in the States, all those memories came back to me. And then I remember, as Billy Graham, the great evangelist, would invite people during his crusade, come, all of you, come on down, all of you, and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By the way, Billy Graham was a fellow North Carolinian, and I grew up in the state of North Carolina. He actually visited our home once, and I didn't even know how great this man was. I had no God in me at that time, but I remember his prayer, a very simple prayer. God, I'm a sinner. You're my Savior. You died on the cross for me. I now want to repent of my sins. I want to give my life to you. Please accept me, Lord, as your own. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And please give me the power of the Holy Spirit to live this life for you from this day forth. And at that moment, literally, I felt this burden of sin, this kind of condemnation just rolled off of my mind, my back, and I was completely delivered from the worldly way and self-centered way at the time. It was kind of like what the, in the Pilgrim's Progress, the Christian experiences as he sees the cross and as he climbs up the the hill, and as he approaches the cross, suddenly the radiant light and revelation of the cross releases him and from this burden of sin that rolls down off of his back. It was that kind of experience. And the uh, next day, I went out into the world, and I felt like the whole world had changed. I felt like I was in heaven, but I was in New York City, you know, smelly, dirty, and nasty and mean people around. Not all New Yorkers are like that, but some New Yorkers are like that. So New York has a sort of like a, a stereotyped image in the minds of the people. But everyone looks so lovely. and They were like angels, the bag ladies, the drug addicts, the prostitutes, and all these dirty and smelly people sitting next to you. And I just wanted to hug everybody. And I went into the dance class instead of Practicing dance, I was evangelizing everybody. And I remember leading a life like that. And then one year later, I enrolled at Fuller Seminary and to become a servant of God. And it just happened that starting that year and for a few years during my stay at Fuller Seminary, Holy Spirit revival came with so much power. Can you believe it? Holy Spirit revival in a seminary. It happened literally, so I got a sort of a boost, an upgrade of spirituality. So for a season of about two years, at most three years, I had this amazing encounter with the Lord on a regular basis, and that sustained me. But I remember at the time, vividly, I didn't know anything at the time. I didn't know the Word of God very well. I read the Word constantly to catch up, but I did not know the Word. I didn't. I'm just learning theology. I didn't have any church experiences. I couldn't even speak Korean, and I'm working for Korean church now. And I was recovering all of these things. And the uh, Holy Spirit started working in my heart and showing me that I don't need all of these things. These are not absolute necessities. I didn't have money. I didn't have a degree. I didn't have any kind of fame or name. I had nothing. I was a poor 
little boy, a child of God, and who just recently discovers that, that God has called me. I'm surrounded by all these pastors that I used to just have reverence for, and I'm supposed to be one of them. I didn't know how to play that part. I felt really awkward. But I remember one thing. That's why this becomes my reference point. I was utterly sufficient. I didn't have anything but the Holy Spirit. I didn't have anything but the Word, even though I'm a novice in understanding the Word. I didn't have anything but my love and adoration for the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't have anything but a heart filled with love for people. And then I began to discover Christians here and there, and I realized I was not alone. I was part of a community, the body of Christ. What the Lord taught me was this. You don't need a lot of things in the kingdom of God to do the works of God, to serve his kingdom purposes. As a matter of fact, I teach my church planting class students, and they're going to hear this from me because we are just into the second week. But I tell them sometime that church planting is not as hard as you think it is. I'm not saying it's easy, but the thing is, you don't have to have a lot of things. You don't have to be ordained. You don't have to uh, have a seminary degree. You don't have to uh, have all the programs. You don't have to have finance. You don't have to have a building. You don't have to have manpower. You don't have to have a great and fantastic worship team. You don't have to have all these people who are willing to serve and volunteer. You may not have anything. But as Jesus said, if two or three of you are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of that. I am there with you. And so I tell my students, what are the bare minimum that is the essentials that we must have? And then we can do anything out there. Money will come. Programs will be established. You may even get a building. And you may come into some kind of support. But you can start with nothing except for these essentials. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. You must focus on Jesus Christ. Everything about Christianity is about Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus we go to the Father. It is because of Jesus we have the Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian God that we know, it is the revelation that was given because of Jesus Christ. Focus on Jesus and you can't go wrong. Second, be grounded in the Word of God. Be ground in the scripture. You don't have to have a lot of theological books and references. Just stick to the Bible. And especially the Gospels. The Bible does not only instruct us, it illustrates to us. It illustrates how the people of God were, the Israelites and the, and the new covenant people of God, the church, but primarily Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John just devoured that, enter into that, be mesmerized by this character and this person of Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit. Anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into our souls and he resides in us. We are now the temple of God. We are the body of Christ. He activates, he empowers. So the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will guide you and within the perimeter of the scripture, Holy Spirit guides you. He will not go outside of that power. Even though he may give you special words or special insight or revelation, always come back to the word so that you don't fall into heresy. These are the basics. And then, most important thing, your heart. Your heart of love for the people. That is all you really need. And then God will provide your team. They will come. You will realize that you are among the company of two or more, two or three, gathered in Jesus' name. And we can totally trust that God will be with us. Well, after those few years, by the time I graduated from Fuller Seminary, I realized I was kind of losing it. I was kind of losing that fire. I was kind of losing 
that sense of touch with that first love, that zeal that I had. And I hear that a lot of people have gone through a similar journey like this. All these heavy theological learnings, you know, academic pressure, making the grades, writing the thesis, all that got to me somehow. And all the church experiences, ministry experiences, I'm beginning to now operate as a youth evangelist and college ministries, going to all these conferences, people calling, come and do a revival service for us. Let's have a sort of like a, an evangelistic crusade. I was being asked to come, and all those ministries was taking toll on me. And I was getting well-disciplined to the side, learning how to pray, learning how to study the Word of God, fellowship with others, witness to others, and, and doing short-term missions and all that. But somehow all this had a heavy burden upon me. I'm sure you can identify with this. Some of you, we just started our semester. This is the second weekend already. Uh, some of you are sensing this. There's so many things, so much schedule, so many programs, so much clutter and distractions, so many books and resources. My library is filled with books. School library, I have one in the Gwangjin-gu area, there's a studio there, there's library, books and books, tons of books. And in addition to that, we have technology and gadgets. I'm a gadget man myself, so I know what it's like to have all these accessories, extras. But the question that I like to pose before you and the question that I ask myself even today, are these not superfluous baggages that we tend to carry on our spiritual journey. We call this pilgrimage on this earth because our destiny is in heaven and yet we want to be so grounded and planted here to a point of being overwhelmed by the things of the world. So I personally have this hunger and thirst to return back to that which is basic foundational Essential. I, I like to use the term bare necessity, absolute minimum. What are the essentials that we need to have? Basically, we need to go back to that first love. We need to go back to Jesus Christ, the scripture, the word of God, and the Holy Spirit, and the love and allegiance that we have for God and for the people. And that's why I chose the text for today, in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. And this was recited by Apostle Paul in the city of Athens, the city filled with all kinds of philosophical notions. But it wasn't his own words. It was actually a word from an ancient poem titled Cretica by Cretan poet Epimenides in somewhere like 600 BC. And here, Epimenides is actually referring in the second person to Zeus. But Paul converts that and he applies in third person and he applies it to one and true God. So Paul had no problem taking a good slogan or motto and converting that as long as it's relevant for us. And to make sure that this scripture or this statement is truly Christian, I would completely convert that statement and say, for in Christ we live and move and have our being. In Christ we live and move and have our being. And I can really understand this language as a dancer and choreographer. Yeah. This is not just a philosophical statement for me. It's not just a statement of simple ontology or existential statement. But I see it as a sort of a kinesthetic dynamic you existing, and you being a bodily being. And with that body, you move, you enact, you interact in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, I don't want to pretend like I'm an Old Testament scholar. We have our prestigious Old Testament scholar sitting right in front of me, so I was kind of nervous. How can I say this? And he's going to have to grade me for this. But it is a common interpretation in Old Testament scholarship that the concept of image of God, image of God, that is we are created, 
in that image in accordance uh, can be interpreted this way. This is a common scholarly uh, opinion that in the ancient Near Eastern tradition, there was this notion that uh, instead of just having a statue representing God, a statue made out of wood, stone, or metal, they got really smart about this, and I think it's quite brilliant. Their idea is that, wait a minute, why don't we let the kings and the pharaohs be the image of God so that instead of the stones and the metal trying to communicate to people, here's this living embodiment of divinity speaking, enacting, and living it out and demonstrating to the people. And that was the concept that I think Moses and the, uh, the authors of the Pentateuch, they, that's the concept that they had. And yet, the interpretation is this. What was generally accepted as something for the elite few, the kings and the pharaohs, now the book of Genesis says all human beings are created according to the image, that we represent God. We are agents of God. That as we exist and as we live and as we move, we are enacting God onto others. A theodrama presentation right there through your tiny little being and our small corporate body. In other words, this is an interpretation that universalizes or even democratizes this concept of image of God, which was monopolized by the kings and the pharaohs. And I was blown away by this notion that we all reflect the very image of God. We represent God in this world. And more, we represent Jesus Christ in this world, in everything that we do. So next time, don't look very far. You don't have to go to the library and look for this. Research it, just look at yourself. I exist. I'm a being. I'm not nothing. I'm something. I'm someone. That sense of beingness. And say, wow, I have life. I'm breathing. I know there's crisis, there's suffering, there's darkness around me, but I'm still breathing. I'm, I still have life. And I'm moving. I'm animated. I, I can enact. I can interact. I can go out into the world. Because God has given me the limbs and the bodily structure to do exactly that. So I remember vividly in those days first two, three years of my Christian life, that's what I was doing. I was actually just living it. And I felt at times that it was not me alone, but somebody was using my eyes to look. Somebody was using my ears to hear. Somebody was using my lips to speak. Somebody was using my arms and legs to enact with the things of the world. I felt like I was kind of like a living puppet and embodied enacting, interacting, being. And I didn't even bother to theologize that. I should have theologized right there and go into the Imago Dei uh, theology, but I didn't. I was just enjoying it. I lived it. And it was so easy. I didn't have to have a lot. I didn't have to finish my seminary degree. I didn't have to rise to the point of maturity in the body of Christ. Even as a baby, I was doing it. And I did just fine. You know what I'm doing? I'm just trying to go back. Go back to that path. To the point of origin. How God gave me that grace and the Holy Spirit. And he equipped me with everything that is necessary. No money. No name. No fame. No church programs. No buildings. None of these things. But I had everything. Please, every one of you. You and I, we have these treasures right in our hands, right in our hearts, right inside of our spirits. We have Jesus Christ. We have the Word of God, the Scripture. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. We have the love of God in our heart. 
to reach out to others. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You did not make it difficult for us, Lord. You did not clutter our lives. You did not clutter our minds and our hearts with so many loaded burdens, but somehow we ended up bearing so many loads, so many things, so much schedule, so many, many, many things. And it's not about that. Your spirit wants to strip us of all these things which are accessories. And you want to get us to that bare minimal realm of essentials. We want to go back to the essentials, Lord. Take us back to that essential, basic and foundational level in our pilgrimage, in our journey of life with you. It is not only about going forward into the future, it is going back and recovering, remembering the height from which we have fallen. It is recovering and restoring that first love and passion that's going to energize us even more. Lord, you had put everything in that nucleus at the very beginning, and somehow we looked around for everything else. Now we come back to the nucleus. We come back to that essence of Jesus Christ and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and the love of God. This is what we come back to. May we be utterly sufficient in you, lacking nothing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.